So um, your elementary school kids should be getting at least 10 hours of sleep. So count that, most of them getting up at 6.30 in the morning on average. They need to be in bed by 8.30. Okay, um, adolescents and our high schoolers, eight and a half to nine and a half. Our high schoolers are struggling really bad with that too. Extracurricular activities are keeping them up. Um, you know, other commitments, their schoolwork, gaming, all of that. So most of them are chronically sleep deprived. And then us as adults, we need seven to nine. Um, we do know that it varies. Not everybody needs nine. Not everybody can survive with seven. Um, that's where that magic number of eight comes in. But as an average, most people cannot function long-term and sustain on less than seven hours, okay? But if you think, oh, I can get by, I'm good. Um, over time, it's gonna have a chronic impact. So what is normal sleep and what does it look like? There's four stages of sleep, but they all go into two buckets, okay? Our REM sleep, I'm sure most people have heard of your REM sleep. That's your dream sleep when you dream, and non-REM sleep. Okay, four stages. Stages one through three are in your non-REM bucket and stages four is in your REM bucket. What does that mean to you? What that means is, and REM stands for rapid eye movement. So stages one, two, and three. Stage one is when you're laying in bed, you're kind of aware of what's going on. You're starting to doze off a little bit. You're not completely asleep, but your brain is starting to produce different spindles to make us go to sleep. That's stage one. Stage two, where our body temperature is going down, our body is getting us ready to go into a night's sleep. Stage three is the magic sleep. That's where a lot of goodness happens, okay? Stage three is the blood supply is redirected away from our brain and it's going to our muscles. <coughs> and stage three is where um, your immune system, that's gonna go on overdrive and it's gonna produce and function more. Um, Injuries, if you have an injury to a leg, broken bone, things like that, you're going to heal more when you get this stage three sleep, and it's because of that increased blood supply that's going. Um, your energy is restored, tissue growth and repair. Um, important ho hormones are released. No, we're not talking about kiddos, but we have talked about this. And, um, what's really important is <coughs> kids that do not get a enough sleep or they have a sleep disorder. If they don't spend enough time in stage three. That's where you have stunted growth. If you have a failure to thrive kiddo, or you have a kid that just can't, they can't put on weight, they seem um, small, it's because they are not releasing their human growth hormone in stage three. That's the biggest time that in their life they're gonna release it in stage three. If you don't have it, they're not gonna release it. Um, but more so for us, like we talk about injuries, again, broken bone, sprained ankle, um, and, and illness. All of that, we our bodies are recreating and they're functioning at its highest in the sleep. If we don't get it, um, it's going to take longer. So our cells produce more protein while we're sleeping, and these protein molecules are building blocks, repairing damage of every kind. Inflammation, just that throughout your body, and so forth. So if you remember anything, remember stage three is really where a lot of, a lot of good stuff happens for your physical body. Second bucket is uh, REM sleep, or your dream sleep. This is your stage four, this is your um, deep sleep. During REM sleep, our bodies, we lose all muscle tone, okay? So we have no muscle tone in our body, um, but our brains are very, very active. So the way that I can tell that somebody is in REM sleep is we have an EEG hooked up, and I can tell by their brain waves. Brains are very, very active. What does that mean? That means in REM sleep, this is what you need for your cognitive, your emotional um, well-being, your, um, your mood, things like that. So breathing and the heart rate become irregular. Again, our bodies are completely relaxed, but our brain is going crazy. Think of it as a file system. So everything that you've just done today, What's going to allow you to form those memories and remember what you did today and things like that, that happens in REM sleep. If you don't get in REM sleep or you can't stay there, this is when you have a hard time remembering stuff. Your brain might be kind of foggy. Um, you just don't seem as sharp or moody. This is where people that suffer from depression, um, this will accentuate that. So more physical in your Stage three, REM sleep is a lot of your brain function and what you need um, to get through that. So in kind of just, we've already talked about this, so stage one, I'm, 
I'm getting ready to go to sleep, I'm in bed, you know, I could be, I can hear what's going on, but I'm not, maybe not moving, I don't want to get up. My body is starting to transition into sleep. My brain spindles are changing so I can tell I'm in sleep. I go to stage two, again, my body temperature drops because that's a way for my body to get ready for sleep. Heart rate goes down, brain begins to um, produce spindles, and then it lasts about 20 minutes. After about 20, 25 minutes, I'm gonna go in to stage three sleep. That's our, our good sleep, right? Our deep sleep. In that, my muscles are relaxed, my blood pressure and breathing drop. This is the deepest sleep. Some people think your REM sleep is the deepest. That's not true, it's really your um, stage three, but both are important. After stage three, I go into REM sleep. Again, my brain is active, my body's relaxed, and this is where a baby, so you're holding a baby and you ever see their eyes kind of flutter or they, you know, smile or their eyes are going like this. Your eyes move when you're in REM sleep, actually. Um, most of the time, you know, your eyelids are closed, but your eyes are going like this the whole time. And it's because your brain is very, very active. Okay? So, now we know what, what makes up sleep. So we're sleeping. Okay, why does it matter? I'm a new mom, I have a new one at home, I'm not getting sleep. Or maybe I'm taking care of an elderly parent. Or maybe I'm working two jobs and I don't get home until late. Or my child has, you know, extracurricular activities. Why do I care and what is that doing to my body if I do it over and over and over? So 37% of Americans um, experience excessive daytime sleepiness that interferes with their daily activities. Sometimes you can tell somebody, you know, say, are, are you tired? And they're like, no, I'm okay, I'm fine. So what we hear in clinic, and this is through the words of a patient, what they will say is, I have no energy. I can't even play with my kids when I get home. My spouse says I'm really moody, or he's like, what's wrong with you today? Or I'm falling asleep at work. You know, we have tons of people that they're at a desk job and it's after lunch and they, they cannot stay awake. Um, the scarier thing driving, you know, so you might not fall asleep driving, but if you ever drove and you get from point A to point B and you think, I don't really remember that, you know, or it's just, you just kind of zone off. So you're not as um, sharp with your thinking skills. That's kind of what's going on. Drove through a red light. I don't have any get up and go. Um, just in general, I just am. Um, I, I don't care if I sit on the couch all evening. I just don't have anything to go. That's, that's sleepy. Sleepy doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna just fall asleep right here. Sleepy is my body is just doesn't have enough to, enough to keep going. What are some other side effects? And go through your whole system. So again, we talked about the irritability. So if you're not getting your REM sleep, you are going to come across irritable. How many, you know, I'm sure all of us have been Maybe we've got a few less hours of sleep than we should, we're cranky, or our fuse is short, or you know we're not as patient with our kids. That's what's going on. Cognitive impairment. People are like I just cannot remember like I used to. You know, everything's very fuzzy, or um, I can't remember what I had for lunch, or so forth. So that's a lot of times what we'll hear. Memory lapse and impaired moral judgment. So people, again, it's just not that crisp thinking that you have. Decreased creativity, increased stress, symptoms similar to ADHD. This is a talk we do with um, kiddos, but it can pertain to adults as well. Is um, a lot of the same, I guess, characteristics. So think of some kids in your classroom if you're in the room. Um, what, what do they possess uh, as their characteristics? They're maybe they're moving a lot, or they can't, can't keep their attention, they're zoning off, they're picking at their neighbor, they're you know, not focusing on what you're doing. All of those are just our body's way of trying to stay awake, okay? So look at those in correlation. Impaired immune system. Again, if you're not getting adequate stage three, your immune system is going to be down. Your, your ability to fight infection will be less. Risk of type two diabetes, and we'll go through that. Decreased testosterone, specifically for males. Um, Increased heart rate variability. We're going to talk specifically about heart disease and stroke as this is um, heart month, but sleep and heart are tied very, very closely. Okay? If you um, go to the doctor or you have any kind of a heart condition, whether it's high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, anything like that, and you've never been assessed for sleep, that's probably the first place you need to go. And we'll talk about that. 
Um, increased reaction time, again, that just goes to that clear thinking, you know. Um, we'll talk about how it impairs drivers, tremors, aches, gross depression. We talked about that specifically in kids. Risk of obesity, and that's because of a specific hormone. The hormone that tells us when I'm eating that I'm full, if you are sleep deprived, that hormone is not released, and that's why you will continue to eat lots more. Um, you don't have that hormone to say, stop, Sarah, you're full. You know, we don't need to eat this anymore. So um, you do see a lot of obesity and then decreased body temperature. So if we talk about our cognitive function, so being awake for extended periods of time to, to um, degrade your performance. 18 hours without sleep. Most people have probably done this, whether you, you know, or just a, it's a long day. Um, that's equivalent to a 0.05% blood alcohol content. Go up to 21 hours without sleep, it's 0.08, and that's the legal limit, okay? There, I can tell you very scarily there's people on the roads driving like this all over. And it might not be that they are aware that they're this sleepy, but you have very impaired drivers all the time. So if you put this in perspective of how important is sleep, would you get behind the car if you knew you were impaired with alcohol? Most people would say no but they don't put that same expression to sleep and what it can do. So keep that as a mental picture. Safety is in compromise. So um, 100,000 sleep-related crashes a year. One of the big populations that we actually test and that we see um, is your truck drivers. We also see a lot of school bus drivers, okay? And the, for the very reason of what we just said. So if they have a sleep disorder, they're not getting enough sleep, um, their impairment with driving your gas truck on the road, your semi on the road, a dump truck on the road, the school bus with your kiddos um, is very impaired. So this just goes. Aside from driving, it's just um, errors at work, okay? Another population that we do a lot of testing on is the nuclear power plant, those um, employees, because you want those employees to be thinking very, very clearly, correct? Um, think of your medical professionals if you're going in for surgery. Think of lots of, there's lots and lots of different professions that can have a very, very big harmful um, reaction if they're not thinking to their, um, as clearly as they think. So we've probably all been here too, unable to keep our eyes open. You know, how many people have rolled down the windows or we've turned up the radio or you're just like, I can keep going or I have some chips or something to eat or I'm gonna constantly be drinking. If you find yourself doing that, um, you know, probably means that you're pretty sleepy, okay? So what are the causes of sleepiness? Again, we have two buckets. So one is your quantity. You're just not getting enough sleep, okay? The other is the quality. You might be sleeping eight, nine hours, but if your quality isn't there, it still doesn't count, okay? So quantity, what's, what's causing that? So insufficient sleep, we talked about that. You know, there's lots going on. We are all very, very busy. Um, I have a lot to do, I finally got my kids to bed, so now it's my time and I can finally get some things. So now I stay up till 11, or I stay up till midnight, and I still get up to go to work in the morning. My quantity of sleep, the number of hours, is not there. It happens with shift work, you know, if anybody's ever worked night shift. Um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to sleep with night shift. You oftentimes will trade sleep for doing things on a normal schedule, so we see that a lot. Medications, lots of medications can impair our sleep substance abuse, and then circadian rhythm disorders, which just means kind of your, your clock, your time clock is, is off. And then what are some of the quality issues um, that would steal that? Obstructive sleep apnea is probably the biggest one, we'll talk about that. Idiopathic hypersomnia, that's just a fancy word for saying you're tired and you don't know why you're tired, but you are excessively sleepy. Narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome, that's specifically um, women are worse with that. Um, Post-traumatic post stress, so if you've had a stressful event in your life or if you've been diagnosed with some of these mental illnesses, that can affect it. And then different neurological disorders, okay? So specifically for the causes, I'm going to go into insufficient sleep and I'm going to talk about obstructive sleep apnea. But again, if you have questions about those later, we can go into those too. So insufficient sleep, what do we mean by that? So if I choose to go to bed at midnight and I'm still getting up at 5.30 in the morning, I have five and a half hours of sleep, okay? My body 
is going to choose to keep me in a lighter stage of sleep. It's not going to zonk me out and put me into a deep sleep. So think back to our stages of sleep we talked about, one, two, three, and four, and our body will cycle through those, okay? So your first REM sleep period, it happens about 90 minutes after you go to bed. I go in that, and then I'm going to cycle back out into lighter sleep, and then I'm going to have REM sleep again. I should have about four REM periods. But what's important to know is that my REM periods get longer as I go through the night. So if I cut my sleep time short, I'm not going to get four periods of REM. I'm going to probably get two. So I'm going to get those first two, which are shorter, and I'm missing out on my big chunks. Does that make sense? So when you have shortened sleep because of the time period, your body is adjusting and it's not going to let you get into deep sleep that's making you stay at um, um, the lighter stages. We just talked about that. So when your brain is starved or REM concentrating, we talked about that, um, it's challenging. Um, loss of sleep increases our body's production of ghrelin. That's that hormone I was talking about that says you're, you're full. Stop. Stop eating. If you're tired, though, you don't produce that and your body won't tell you to stop. Um, lack of sleep also decreases the hormone leptin, um, which is another food in hunger one. They work together. Um, so that's kind of insufficient sleep in a, in a nutshell. And that's I'm choosing not to have enough. Next thing that steals lots of sleep from us is electronics. Okay, so a lot of, you know, I get on my children a lot, get off your screens, this and that, but as adults, we're just as guilty. Okay, why does it matter? Why do you hear over and over to turn off your phone at least, you know, an hour or so before bed? Why is blue light bad? Here's the science behind it. Okay, so think back to even when you were growing up, your grandparents, how did they know to go to bed? When the sun goes down, we start getting ready for bed, right? Our brains are reactive to, there's decreased light. Okay, I'm going to produce melatonin. I'm sure you guys have all heard melatonin. It's time to almost go to bed. When do they get up? They get up when the sun comes up, and we're going to go about our day. Our brain and our eyes are very reactive to light. So, I'm at home. The sun's going down. My body's producing melatonin. Now I'm going to look at my phone. So what does that blue light do? That blue light is essentially tricking my brain because my brain is saying, oh, it's light. It shuts off my production of melatonin and it thinks that I need to stay awake longer, okay? That's what the blue light, when you hear that, is happening. So we use that. Blue light suppresses melatonin, which this is the part of your brain. It's not producing it, so you stay awake longer. Even if I shut my phone off, it's going to take my body that whole cycle to start producing melatonin again and go back to sleep. Some people can fall asleep right away, but this will affect you getting into that deep sleep, that three and four. So this is why when you hear stay off the phones and electronics, and this is very important for kiddos too, um, because this is truly stealing and robbing a lot of our quality sleep that we have. Um, blue light, you know, on your phone, you can change it to different modes. I think it's night shift mode, um, or if you're reading on a Kindle or reading on that, turn it to where it is not that blue light, it's kind of the white um, light, that's fine. Um, it's truly the blue light that affects us in our, in our eyes. Okay, so maybe you can't go to sleep, or something's affecting that you can't get enough sleep. So Sarah, what, what do I do? Um, you know, we all know maintain a regular bedtime and wake time, including weekends. So, you know, it's very much, you should not alter your bedtime and wake time by more than an hour from a weekday to a weekend. Let's say weekdays, you go to bed by 10 o'clock. Um, you shouldn't go to bed by midnight on weekends, you know, because your, your circadian rhythm is constantly in, in motion and it's juggling. Um, establishing a regular bedtime routine, again, not going straight to your phone, is there something else you do? You take a shower, or read a book, um, different things like that. Dark, quiet environment, a cool sleep environment, so they do recommend 72, 71 degrees or less. Um, if you have a really hot bedroom, um, when you remember back to the stages of sleep, our body wants to cool ourselves and our body temperature before it lets it go in there to sleep. So if your bedroom is at 76, 77, I don't know if anybody does that, 
my body's working hard to even get it down, you should have a cooler environment so it's not working so hard to even get there. Red lights for night lights, this is a lot for kiddos. Um, again, a blue light, if you think of what are most night lights now, they're LED, they're blue, or alarm clocks are blue and they're you know, screaming on the ceiling. Um, again, go back, I remember my alarm clock from high school and what color were the numbers? Red. Do you guys remember? Yeah. So, and they had it, they had it right back then. All of our clocks, they were red. Now we've turned to blue, which that's the worst color that you can have. So if you have kiddos and you they need a they need a night light, um, you should put a red bulb in. Um, and if you have an alarm clock that's really bright, you should turn it away from you because even when you're sleeping, if that's you know facing you, um, that can trick and inhibit your brain as well. Comfortable with mattress and pillow. Um, using bedroom for purposes only, eating at least two to three hours before you go to bed. Um, there are specific foods that we know, this tryptophan, it's another hormone that encourages you to sleep. Um, milk, bananas, like turkey, that's why Thanksgiving, turkey does have something that makes you tired. Um, a bowl of cereal, those are good snack ideas if you need something before you go to bed. Try to not do heavy foods, spicy foods, anything that's going to make your um, because anything you're eating, your stomach is on overdrive and it's going to digest it. So now when it should be relaxing, it's working hard. And when it's working, it's again not letting you get into those deeper stages of sleep. Um, exercising regularly is important. Um, before bedtime, at least an hour or two, avoiding caffeine, avoiding alcohol. A lot of people will say, oh, I have a glass of wine or a couple beers and that relaxes me and I sleep better. You might think you're going to sleep, but alcohol actually inhibits you from getting into your stage three and four. So you might fall asleep, but you're going to stay stuck in about stage two, and you're not getting that regenerative sleep that you need. Um, 20 minute power naps can help you feel refreshed, but anything longer than that, basically you need to sleep 20 minutes or you need to sleep for the duration of about an hour and a half. Here's why. Think back to our stages of sleep, okay? Your deep sleep is stage, what, three, and REM sleep is four. If you take a nap, you want to take a nap, and you want to wake up out of stage two. You do not want to wake up out of stage three because we, our body's working and our minds, all that goodness is happening. If you wake up out of stage three or you wake up out of REM, which I'm sure some of you have woke up in the morning and you have a dream and you're just like, oh, I just want to go back to sleep and finish the dream, your body is going crazy with all these hormones and things that are happening. You will feel joggy for about two hours until your body releases all that. So the purpose of a 20 minute nap is, I lay down for 20 minutes, I should not get into stage three or REM sleep then, but it is enough to make me feel refreshed. If I can't get up after 20 minutes, then 90 minutes is your cycle for to get all the way through REM, then wake up out of that and you'll come, you know, full circle and you'll come back out of one. Does that make sense? So if you've heard of a cat nap, that's why you should take a small cat nap um, and just try not to wake up out of those deep stages. Also something to think about with your bedtime, if you're waking up consistently and you're dreaming, you need to try to shift your bedtime back a little bit because even 10, 15 minutes, you shift it back that allows you to not wake up out of REM when your alarm clock goes off, but now I'm probably cycling back into one or two, and you will feel so much better getting up. So it's kind of a, a trick and things to, to think about, but that's the science behind that and why, why you feel the way you do. So that's quantity sleep, not quality sleep. So somebody with obstructive sleep apnea, what is it? If I have obstructive sleep apnea and I'm getting my eight, nine, ten hours of sleep, but it's not good sleep, it doesn't really count. It's not, it's not giving me what I need. So what is um, obstructive sleep apnea? So it affects about 18 million Americans. 80% um, of men and 93% of women are undiagnosed. So let that think in a little bit. Yes, we know obstructive sleep apnea is very prevalent. Um, but it's more prevalent than what we know because there are so many that are undiagnosed. So it's a progressive disorder. Um, you know, we get asked all the time, well, snoring really bad? Does it have to be bad? No, but it usually starts with snoring, okay? So I can be snoring, and if I, 
If I'm getting a sufficient breath, but I just have that vibratory snore, it's okay as long as it's not affecting my heart rate, it's not affecting different things. But as I get older, um, women, our hormones change. Men, when they hit decreased testosterone, um, if we gain weight, anything like that, that progressive snoring goes into upper airway syndrome and obstructive sleep apnea. So again, snoring by itself is okay. If it's not causing me to wake up, um, it's not causing me daytime sleepiness, it's truly just making annoyance to a bed partner or I just know I snore, that's okay, but you do need to think about. We get to this point where our spouse is sleeping in another room, you know, nobody wants to sleep by me, nobody wants to share a room with me, um, then we have to start thinking about it. Lots of squiggly lines, but what this is, is this is what a sleep study looks like, okay? These top lines are EEG leads, so it's leads that we put on your brain and it's gonna tell me what stage of sleep you're in. EKG is your heart. Snoring, it's a flat line, so I'm not snoring. And then you see these air flows, so as it flows like that, that's a good sign, because that means I'm breathing in, breathing out, it's just normal flow. So now I'm snoring, you can see right here, my brain's still fine, EKG's still fine, I'm still getting enough air, but you can see that I am, it is picking up some snoring. Okay, so when do I care about snoring? Well, I care about snoring when um, it turns into obstructive sleep apnea. If you break down what those terms are, obstructive means um, like a blockage in your sleep, and apnea means cessation of flow, so there's no flow. So we're breathing in, this is kind of our uvula in the back, when I lay especially on my back, all this tissue falls backwards. Again, remember in REM, we lose all of our muscle tone. So if I lose my muscle tone, even in my airway, it just collapses. If that collapses, air tries to get in and it stops. Okay? That's what's happening with sleep apnea. And this is what sleep apnea looks like. Again, my um, leads on my brain. This is my EKG. Do you see a difference in our airflow? Before we were like this, right? So what's happening is snoring, my airflow, and then, and that's that. So I'm stopping breathing, okay? I'm sure most of you have heard somebody snoring and that's exactly what it is. It's a, and then they might kind of gasp or wake themselves up, that's here. You can also see without even knowing what an EEG looks like, do you see how my brain waves move? What that's doing is, when my brain wants to be in stage three, our magical sleep, or it wants to be in REM, our magical sleep, our body says, no way, get out of that because when you're in deep sleep, you stop breathing. So this is where your quality sleep comes in. Your body is smart and it's not gonna let you stay in those deep stages of sleep. And it's gonna keep waking you up over and over and over and over. And then do you see now how we're not spending the time that we need to? Second thing I want you to see is, um, it's kind of hard to see on this one, but in the yellow, this is my oxygen saturation. So just like during the day, if I were to hold my breath, and this is 60 seconds, so this person stopped breathing for about 30 seconds. So if I hold my breath for 30 seconds, most people probably can't do it. What happens? My heart's gonna go in overdrive, it's gonna start pumping. My oxygen level's gonna go down because I'm not getting any breath in. And that's what's happening here. So there, oxygen is up and down and up and down. You can see it better on this next slide. So this is a five minute section of a sleep study of somebody that has sleep apnea. So look, just at the top of the brain, you see that it's in a cluster, right? I mean, we are waking up and going to sleep and waking up and going to sleep. This is EKG, so we know that they're snoring. Here's our airflow. Breathe, stop, breathe, stop, breathe, stop. So this is over five minutes. So that's more than every minute. They're stopping for about 30 seconds. Um, and then look at their oxygen. So this SAO2 is your oxygen, and then you see that? We don't want that movement. Again, so over and over and over and over again at nighttime, this is what's happening. My oxygen falls, my heart rate goes up, my blood pressure goes up, my body is in a state of frantic when it should be relaxed and rejuvenating itself. It's working harder at sleep than it is um, during the day. Does that make sense? 
So this is kind of fair. It's like, okay, I have orders to wake you up at 10.30. That's exactly what's happening. You might not remember, your spouse might not remember, but if you've ever watched somebody, you know, they shake themselves awake and then they go back right back to sleep. So they didn't remember that they just did that, but guess what? They just woke up and then they do that over and over. So that's exactly what it is. It's like somebody poking you awake every six to seven minutes, okay? So what are the symptoms? How do I know? Why should, why should I be um, concerned? So daytime symptoms of sleep apnea were sleepy. Well, we know that sleepiness can be from lots of things, but if you are excessively sleepy, fatigue, sometimes people say, what's the difference between sleepiness and fatigue? Sleepiness is I am about ready to fall asleep. I'm falling asleep at my desk. Fatigue is, I got through the day, but if I sit on the couch, I might not fall asleep, but I don't have the energy to go. Like I just, I have nothing left. Morning headache. The morning headache is caused from that up and down of your oxygen and your CO2 is up. That's what your body's response is. So if you wake up with a morning headache. Poor concentration or memory loss. Dry throat. Um, personality changes. And that doesn't have to be big, but it can be your spouse saying, what is wrong with you today? Or your kids saying, well, why are you so rally? You know, it's just that constant, you're just irritable. Um, decreased libido is a big thing, and then depression and moodiness. Now what are the nighttime symptoms? Snoring with arousals, choking or gasping, and I just um, demonstrated that. Frequent nighttime urination. This happens a lot, and this is a lot with men. It'll happen with them in their prostate um, first, but it's kind of what comes first, more so the carrot. And they might wake up, and they say, well, I got up six times every night because I have to pee. Most of the time, they wake up because of a sleep disorder, then they say, oh, well, I may as well get up and go to the bathroom. But you can't put that correlation together. But if you have somebody that is, has more than one to two times, unless they're on like Lasix or something like that, um, you shouldn't be uh, having that much nighttime urination. Night sweats, that's your body's, re it's a heart reaction. So it's your body's, um, it's that parasympathetic sympathetic response and it's that reaction to your body saying, whoa, my blood pressure and my heart rate have been all over the place. So if you wake up and you're in a pool of sweat, you're hot, sheets are wet, um, that's something. Acid reflux, that's another big thing. Um, most people don't put this correlation, but if you think about, um, so acid reflux is I got the acid in my belly and it's gonna come up through my esophagus, right? Think of a plunger reaction. So I'm snoring and I stop. So there's no airflow here. No airflow, but my brain is still telling me to breathe. And that's when you get the, if you've ever seen that, and somebody's like trying to breathe, but they cannot pull, you know, past this. Think of a plunger. So I'm pulling, that plunger is going like this. When I finally break through all this acid that I've just plunged, when I breathe, now it's going to come up through my esophagus. Does that make sense? So if you ever, or somebody complains of, I woke up and now they've got the hiccups or they have um, burning, you know, heartburn and things like that. That's something to think about because something is causing, your ass and your belly should be pretty relaxed, but something's causing it to be uh, working. And then again, it's that plunger. You open your airway, takes the path of least resistance, and then that's when you taste it or it's going to have heartburn. Drooling, um, restlessness, you have um, all over the bed, your sheets are, um, you know, always in disarray, you have spouses as your kicking me or this or that, and then if you have insomnia. Those are the most common. Treatment, um, there is different modalities. CPAP is probably the most common, but there's more and more with dental appliances, um, orthodontic interventions. People will say, well, if I lose weight, will that help? It will help, but we're kind of fighting or losing time, too. As we get older, again, our hormones are changing. We're losing elasticity. Um, a large amount of weight loss that doesn't necessarily always cure it. Can, but um, not. What did the dental or thing do? So what it does is you can see it's a mouth guard and it's a specific mouth guard. You put it in and if you take your jaw and kind of move it forward, it's not that dramatic, but what happens is now my airway that is normally like this, now I'm gonna hold it like this, it extrudes that and now I'm opening my airway. So whenever I want to go to sleep, it's in a position where it's open. 
The thing to note with an oral appliance, though, is typically it works well for mild sleep apnea. If you have severe sleep apnea, again, it's just moving it a tiny bit, which is all you need if you have mild, but if you have severe sleep apnea, it might not be enough to do it. Does that answer your question? So what this is, is again, this is part of a sleep study. What we're looking at is, look here, this is apnea. Each line, which whenever it's a solid color, Whenever it's a solid color, it means that we're having apnea after apnea after apnea after apnea. So basically, here's my stages of sleep, wake, REM, one, two, three, four. So you can see that I don't spend a lot of time. I'm in and out. The black line is REM sleep. This is where I start CPAP. Do you see any black other than those few little lines? What that tells me is this patient right here is the diagnostic part of their study. They, didn't, they went into REM a tiny bit, but not very much. And in three would be this line. They didn't stay in three very long. The majority of their time is in two, wake. Do you guys see how I'm reading that? So the majority of their time is in wake one and two. Right here, we put on CPAP, we start at zero, we titrate it up. You see that our apnea events were eliminated, right? And all CPAP is is just constant air. It's not oxygen. It is airflow. So when my airway wants to close, the airflow splints it open like this, okay? I splint open my airway. Now, see my big stretch of REM? So my body's kind of like, oh, thank you. I can finally go into REM. And then here's all my oxygen desaturation. See how I'm crazy? So this has to make you look like you sleep better than this. Do you guys see that? So this is exactly what a snapshot is of your body in, in, in the craziness and in the chaos. Whether your treatment be anything, it just shows you that once you treat it, how it can be better. Okay, so how does it hurt our heart? We touched on it briefly, but again, when our body is sleep deficient, whether it's quality or quantity, our body is going to release a stress hormone. It's the same stress hormone as that fight or flight um, that you have. It's if you've ever been stressed or um, scared or anything like that and you felt your heart rate go up, has everybody felt that? That's your body's response, okay? When you're sleep deficient, it's constantly sending out the stress hormone. If it's sending out the stress hormone, my heart rate is elevated, my blood pressure is elevated over time. So what it also does is it increases inflammatory markers. Well, what we know, a lot of heart disease is inflammation in your heart. It can be inflammation in your vessels, arteries, veins, things like that. That inflammation and that stress hormone never goes down to a level of normal until you can get sufficient sleep. Again, it needs to be both quantity and quality sleep. But you can see why over time, might not happen when you're in your 20s, might not even happen when you're in your 30s, but this is when, you know, somebody goes in in their 40s or their 50s and they're like, fuck, my blood pressure's high. Start my medication, they can't get it down. Unless you treat your underlying thing that is causing the, you know, the responses for that, no amount of medication is going to, because your heart is in constant chaos at night when it should be relaxing. So untreated obstructive sleep apnea, Increases your risk of high blood pressure, stroke, coronary artery disease, and irregular heartbeat. The irregular heartbeat, the most common is probably atrial fibrillation, if you've ever heard of that. Atrial fibrillation is the atria, the top part of our heart, that just kind of quivers. So it's not beating like it should. Why does that happen? Well, I just explained why our blood pressure has surges throughout the night. Think of it like my skin is fine, but now my knee scratching is like my blood pressure. So all night I am just irritated up, down, up, down, up, and down. What's going to happen to my skin if I eventually just keep scratching? It's going to make a sore. It's going to be irritated, right? That's what happens with atrial fibrillation. Think of it as your heart muscle. Your heart is irritated, and it finally says, I've had enough, and I can't even beat past it, so it just starts quivering. Get on medication. Some people have to be cardioverted. But again, unless you treat and let that heart muscle relax, it's going to be irritated all the time. It's that inflammation marker. Statistics, and this just came out with the American Heart Association, but 49% of patients with AFib also have obstructive sleep apnea. 83% of drug-resistant high blood pressure. So this means I've got high blood pressure, they put me on lisinopril. 
And then it wasn't reacting, so they also put me on HCTZ or something like that. So I'm on medicine, but nothing is making my blood pressure go down. 83% of those people have underlying sleep apnea. And 76% of men, men are obviously, um, they are affected more. They, 76% of them also have sleep apnea. So we can't stress enough that, again, if you, a loved one, a spouse, a mother, a father, a daughter, son, anybody that you know, they just got the wrong for high blood pressure. And this isn't everything for your heart, but it makes you more than happy to question it, okay? So if you are on blood pressure medicine, or if you know somebody that is in and out of AFib, or they're in and out of, um, they have congestive heart failure, um, and they've never been asked the questions at a doctor's office, it's worthy of a conversation with your doctor. Okay, so what are some other sleep disorders that could be robbing us of our quality sleep? I kind of touched on the insomnia, restless leg, parasomnia, that's when people act out their dreams, um, narcolepsy, and circadian rhythm disorders. This is just a very um, generic list of how do I know if something's going on? Should I talk to my doctor? Do you snore? Has you or anybody observed that you stop breathing or gasp for breath? Do you feel sleepy or do you doze off like can't make it through a movie or I'm, you know, fall asleep reading or I'm a passenger in a car and I can't make it an hour, I'm going to fall asleep. Those are all things that um, probably indicate that you're tired. If you have difficulty sleeping three nights a week or more, and that can mean I can't fall asleep or I fall asleep and then I wake up at midnight and then I can't go back to sleep, so something is disrupting that. Um, or if you wake up too early, you can't get back to sleep. Restless leg is described as creepy crawly feelings in your legs. So if you ever have like the feeling that you need to move your legs and stretch them, or you feel like there's spiders crawling up, it's, it's nerve endings in your legs and it can affect people and they feel like they just have to kick. Um, that's indicating restless leg syndrome. And then interruptions in your sleep. Again, nighttime heartburn, bad dreams, Pain, discomfort, noise, sleep difficulty of members, um, lighter temperature. If anything on there kind of rings a bell, like maybe one, all of those indicate a different uh, sleep disorder that it's worth just having a conversation with your doctor to, to talk about. Um, the F4 sleepiness scale, this is something I can email you and you can send out to your members, but there's a few different scales that you can just take at your own time and it tells you, you might not think you're tired, but once you score this, you're like, Maybe I am. So truly, in general, sleep. So you go to the doctor. They're always going to check your blood pressure. They're always going to check your heart rate. They're going to check your respirations. Probably going to ask about your mood. Think back to your um, physical that you're having. They should also be asking you about sleep, OK? Um, sleep, what we know, is just as vital as health and nutrition in our overall health, OK? So think of it as that trifecta of what we need to be the healthiest us. Um, and really understanding that sleep quality and quantity matter. So if you have one but not the other, you might not still be getting the benefits. Um, the main thing is, is that most sleep disorders are very, very treatable. They really are. Um, CPAP is not another medication. Um, you know, insomnia treatments typically isn't either restless leg. So it could be something small that's making a big impact on your sleep. And hopefully what you've learned today is that those small things are affecting my sleep, which then compound and they have lots of big, um, you know, reactions to what's going on. So I feel like I talked really, really fast. Does, did this make sense or was it helpful? Did you know everything that I talked about or learn anything? I have a question. Sure. Um, is there any oh, <laughs> is there any kind of correlation between people who sleep on their back versus sleeping on their side versus sleeping like at a weird angle or whatever? So as it pertains to sleep apnea, those that sleep on their back, it's worse. The reason it's worse is I'm laying flat again. I'm looking at my airway. If I lay like this, I've got all the weight of my neck and at just my body. It's going to flatten that out. So sleep apnea on a patient's back is worse, almost always. Um, most of the time, patients, as a way to kind of self-trick themselves, even if they don't know, they'll either prop themselves up on pillows, so they're laying more at an angle. And that's because now gravity 
drops everything and it's not, you know, it's going to help me keep it open. As well as if I'm on my side, again, gravity drops it open. So if you think you have some fat in your spouse, the best thing to do is stay off of your back. It's not always easy to do that, but, you know, start off or sleep elevated. That's, that's helpful. Does that answer your question?
If you can go there, though, with this questionnaire, and it's already targeted, Doc, this is my question, then they're like, yep, yeah, thank you. And then they are trained to know, okay, it's not this, 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 but it's maybe this, and this is what I need to do. So the more that you have, journaling is a great thing, though. I mean, journaling is good if you're thinking of insomnia. Insomniacs, you know, they truly, am I having a hard time going to sleep? When am I going to sleep? Um, if I'm waking up, and if I can go to sleep, but I wake up in the middle of the night, what time am I waking up every night, um, and so forth. So the more information that you can have and bring to them, then they know what to do with it. But I will email that, and you can email it to everybody. Same with this, and then the same with the upward sleepiness scale, too. You can just bring all of that in there, um, or even if it's not you, if it's a family member, you know, give it to them, and then, you know, they can use it. But that's the most helpful to um, your physician. You know, sleep, it's not just for adults, it's for kids. Kids is probably my biggest passion because I think we have a huge opportunity that we're missing. Um, if any of you guys are educators in the room, I don't know what your uh, positions are, or even if you're, you know, in food services or anything like that, you guys are seeing these kids all day, every day. You have more of a snapshot with them than their parents do, and guess what? You can identify maybe potential, you know, factors that the, the parents don't see, and because you're in a structured environment. So I do think that um, in the education field, we have a huge responsibility to really watch these kiddos because if it's sleep and I can help them or I can help educate a parent um, and that can help them to not go down the whole, you know, the rabbit hole of this diagnosis or they might get excluded from friends because I act like this or their grades are falling and because they can't pay attention um, or if they're just exhausted and tired all the time or maybe they don't know, I can't play on my Xbox until 3 in the morning, what's that really doing? Um, Sleep's affecting all of us. It's affecting us from newborns all the way up to, you know, elderly. Um, but the more that we can be in tune, and the more that you can realize that it's very fixable, and the more you can realize how good you feel once you fix it, that's my favorite part of the clinic setting, I will tell you. I can, you know, I might have a patient come in, and they're tired. I can tell they're tired, you know? You're just, they just have the look about them, okay? We can test them and get them treated, let's say it's two months later, they come in a new person. And it is always, I did not realize how bad I felt, I did not realize how tired I was, and I will, and I'll kind of end on this, I know we're getting, I'll speak for my husband. So my husband is 41, no health issues, he runs every morning, very, very active, has kind of a high stress job, has never had problems, started having some dizziness, and this is all just kind of started going on. And he's like, something is just not right. He checks his blood pressure, it's been fine. Went to the doctor, blood pressure is out of the roof. Um, like, okay, you need to chill. It's probably because you're anxious, your job, your this, your that. He does not snore, but being in the sleep field, I'm like, I think you're restless. Like, you're moving all over the bed, you're not sleeping well, you're tired all the time. I have access, let's go do a sleep study. Do a sleep study, he has severe sleep apnea. If you had told me I could get severe, I would have said, no. He has been on CPAP for two weeks, and this is not a proponent of CPAP, but it's a proponent of treating your sleep apnea. And his blood pressure, he is still on half of his dose, but has dropped dramatically. What we knew, and we never would have guessed it, but basically his resting heart rate went from 52 to 110 all through the night. So he had a swing of about 50 to 60 feet per minute. Again, over and over and over. So this is not, he's not obese. I mean, so this is where we have to get the stigma out, and this is pertaining to sleep apnea. It is not for the overweight. It is not for the older. It is not for, there is no face to what sleeping disorders look like, okay? But there's a huge impact. My husband's a prime thing that we wouldn't have looked at it. He would have been struggling with getting his blood pressure under control. He would have had probably major heart disease in about 10 years because over time, his body is just stressed on it, okay? Can you use him because he's not here and he won't. <laughs> but but that, that's just something I want you guys to see. It is not, it doesn't pick one person. Um, 
but it's it's very treatable, and um, especially as we're looking at heart health and you know keeping us all healthy, we need to look at all factors. And if we this sleep is something that we can fix, and we don't like to sleep right, then know what it does. How low should your heart rate go, or where's it? So everybody's different. Those that are really, really active or like running, kind of like even your resting heart rate now. Um, some people will sit in the 50s, even the high 40s. Um, at night, just as we talked about, when your blood pressure go down, your heart rate should go down at nighttime. Um, in the sleep lab, we see it in the high 30s, low 40s. Um, some people can tolerate that. Some people get lightheaded if they're, you know, that. But most of the time, people will drop 10 to 20 beats per minute below, like if your resting heart rate is 80, you're going to drop, you know, 60, 65 at night. Um, if you're somebody that's 100, you're going to, you know, drop to 80 or so forth. So you want your heart rate to drop at night. You don't want it crazy low, but um, yeah, you want it because that's when it gets into where it's, it's resting. Because yeah. the surge isn't to make, when my body responds and increases my heart rate, it therefore then increases my blood pressure. And that's that constant stress hormone surge that my blood pressure is up, heart rate's up, and then I can start breathing again, then it goes down. And then I don't, and so it's this. That up and down is harder than even just staying high. Thank you.